we come We are gathered together To lift up your name To call on our Savior To fall on your grace Hear the joyful sound Of our offering As your saints bow down As your people sing We will rise with you Lifted on your wings Saints bow down as your people sing. We will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will see that our God saves. Our God saves. There is hope in your. From the letter of Jude, uh, verses 20 and 21. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then from St Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. As we come to God in prayer tonight, friends, uh, may I welcome you to worship from the cenital. And Having heard our call to worship, we're going to hear a few more words from Holy Scripture. Uh, this was a uh, passage from the letter to the Hebrews that appeared in my morning prayers today. And I thought it was so appropriate, uh, both as a piece of scripture for coming together to worship and also for Trinity Sunday, and I hope you agree. This is from Hebrews chapter 12. You have come to Mount Zion the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, to the full concourse and assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of good men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, whose sprinkled blood has better things to say than the blood of Abel. The kingdom we are given is unshakable. Let us therefore give thanks to God for it, and so worship God as he would be worshipped, with reverence and awe, giving glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, one God glorious for ever. Amen. Let us pray. God the Father, God beyond us we adore you for you are the depth of all that is you are the ground of our being we can never grasp you 
yet you grasp us. The universe speaks to you of us. And your love comes to us through Jesus Christ. God the Son, God beside us, we adore you. For you are the perfection of humanity. You have shown us what human life should be like. In you we see divine love and human greatness combined. God the Holy Spirit, God around us, we adore you. For you draw us close to Jesus and the Father. You are the power within us. You give us abundant life and make us the men and women that you call us to be. Father, Son and Spirit, God beyond, beside and around us, we adore you. Be present, most holy God in Trinity, during this time of worship. And may each of us experience you in your fullness. May our praise be pleasing to your ears. And may your spirit fill our heart this night and forevermore. Amen. Our first hymn this evening, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Let us pray. As we come to this, our prayer of confession, we remember uh, some words from Ephesians. God the Father forgives us in Christ and heals us by his Holy Spirit. Therefore, let us put away all anger and bitterness, all slander and malice, and confess our sins to God, our Redeemer. So let us pray. 
O God, who has created us for your service, has redeemed us by the cross of your dear Son, and convinced us of our sin by your Holy Spirit. We confess that we have not loved you with all our heart and soul, with all our mind and strength, and that we have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We have been unworthy of the faith into which we have been baptised, and have broken the unity of your church here in earth. Have mercy on us, O God, and in your great mercy forgive us our sins. Renew us by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may serve you in holiness and righteousness all our days. To your honour and glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us be comforted and gladdened as we hear the good news of the gospel. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the end that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In the name of Jesus Christ, I declare to all those who have confessed their sins to God that he of his great love and mercy freely absolves and forgives you of all your sin. He offers you now the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen. And as we prepare to hear scripture read and sung, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we know that it is to your word that we turn in times of need, in times of joy, in times of confusion, and in times of sadness. We pray that tonight your holy scriptures may be a lamp to guide our way may be a rule to live our lives by, and may be a means to come to know you better through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and in the power of your Holy Spirit, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our first reading this evening comes from the letter of Paul to the Romans, the fifth chapter, beginning at the first verse. Paul writes, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Our psalm this evening is a, a modern version of Psalm 8, uh, with words by John Bell, and it is sung for us by a Methodist choir whose details appear on the screen. Oh, 
I think you'll agree with me that that's a really lovely tune. Um, it's a Scottish folk tune, as I say, with the words of Psalm 8 uh, set to it by John Bell. Our second reading this evening is read for us by Daniel Gilder. Uh, our second reading comes from the book of Matthew, verses 16 to 20. Oh, sorry, beg your pardon, chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. <laughs> the 11 disciples made their way to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to meet him. When they saw him, they knelt in worship, though some were doubtful. Jesus came near and said to them, full authority in heaven and on earth has been committed to me. Go therefore to all nations and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. I will be with you always to the end of time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, uh, Daniel, for reading that passage for us. We now hear our Old Testament reading, which is taken from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter six. Isaiah writes, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory and the foundations of the thresholds shook, and the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, taking in his hand a burning coal, from the tongs of the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Our next hymn again comes from Scotland and I'm indebted to uh, the Reverend Ian Cunningham, who very kindly allowed me to use it for this service. Uh, Church Hymnary 4, 113, to a well-known tune, uh, hymn, God the Father of Creation. <laughs>
there's a joke that goes round that says that the most successful ministers are the ones who take Trinity Sunday as a Sunday off. Uh, yet I love Trinity Sunday and I love it for two reasons. Firstly, because in many churches, it is the one Sunday of the Christian year that the preacher will use a visual aid or a prop. You'll often see funny ways to try and describe the Trinity and they often end up going wrong. Somebody I know tried to explain the Trinity by making a triangle out of plastic drinking straws, claiming that triangles are the strongest shape. Uh, unfortunately for her, the triangle fell apart during her illustration, which didn't uh, show triangles to be very strong at all. Secondly, I love Trinity Sunday because I find it very reassuring. And it's something of that reassurance that I hope to pass on this evening. Our sermonette will be slightly shorter than usual, uh, but I don't think that's any bad thing once in a while. Isaiah the prophet who wrote our Old Testament Bible reading was, as I said, a prophet. He was a person to whom God spoke or gave messages, and it was his job to pass them on to whomsoever God directed. He was a messenger, and often his job was a very hard one. We all know the adage that speaking truth to power is a very difficult thing, and we see that in the book of the prophet Isaiah. One day though, Isaiah had a dream or a vision. In this dream, he saw God sitting on his throne. The robes that God wore were so long and flowing that they filled the whole temple. And God stood these great heavenly figures known as seraphim. These beings were calling one to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. There was a thunderous noise. And it was as though the whole foundations of the buildings shook and Isaiah was afraid. He cried out, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now the Bible, as you may know, is made up of different kinds of writing. In the pages of our Bibles, we find poetry, history, visions or dreams, or a mixture of the three, or others. This passage from Isaiah is most certainly a dream or a vision. Now we don't need to get bogged down in the whys and wherefores or the hows of what Isaiah saw and wrote. We don't need to worry that Isaiah's lips would probably have burned to a cinder if somebody had put a, a blazing coal on them. We don't need to worry about what the seraphim looked like or what they did or what they were for. All of this, in a sense, is immaterial. But the point of the Bible reading is most certainly not immaterial. We need to remember first and foremost that God has the most marvellous way of speaking to his people through their dreams and visions. Those who remember the helpfully named Mr Sermon's sermon from a few weeks ago will recall that John of Patmos had a similarly extraordinary vision in the book of Revelation. Uh, it was Joseph who had a dream in the middle of the night to take his family out of, uh, into Egypt. Uh, Peter saw a vision, rise Peter, kill and eat. All of these were ways that God spoke to his people. And indeed he continues to now. Many people will uh, come up with the most wonderful ideas as a result of dreams and it will seem as though God is behind that as well. We're not expected to believe that what we heard in Isaiah happened in real life. Now I'm careful with how I say that because I do believe that uh, Holy Scripture is the word of God and I'm not the sort of person who goes about saying that we don't need to believe that, or we don't need to believe this. But the point is, Isaiah made it very clear that it was a vision. I don't believe that Isaiah was moved into some heavenly temple and there surrounded by all these beings, rather it was something he saw in his head. It was a dream or a vision. That's the first thing to remember, because often one of the first things we hear whenever we read anything like this is, Tuh, that wouldn't have happened, Tuh, that didn't happen. Well, it didn't, not in that way, but it did for Isaiah. And that's what mattered, because that's what God wanted Isaiah to see. That's the first point. But back to the passage. In his dream, Isaiah felt unworthy even to see the Lord. He felt that he was a man of unclean lips. He wasn't worthy to see God face to face. And in the Old Testament world, that was right. 
because nobody could see God face to face without dying. Indeed, even those who were closest to God didn't get to see him face to face. The authorised or the King James Version of the Bible rather amusingly described Moses as saying the Lord's backside in Exodus chapter 33. Even nowadays, when thinking of somebody who is deceased, we think of them seeing the Lord face to face. Something has changed, friends, and that which has changed uh, came about through Jesus Christ. As a result of Jesus Christ, we can stand before God face to face through him. There's an old Sankey hymn, It Passeth Knowledge, That Dear Love of Thine, containing the phrase, Lord Jesus, when thee face to face I see, when on the lofty throne I sit with thee, then of thy love in all its breadth and length, its height and depth, its everlasting strength, my soul shall sing. Isaiah knew that he was not worthy to see the Lord in this way, but clearly the Lord wanted to see him. Therefore, to put him at his ease, the Lord directed that Isaiah's lips be made clean using a coal drawn from the altar. When we imagine this altar, we mustn't think of the communion tables we see in our churches nowadays. These weren't lovely ornate tables in the corner of the church. Rather, in the Old Testament at least, the altar was the place that the animal sacrifices were offered. In many ways, it was more of a fireplace, it seems, because it was there that the burnt sacrifices were made. And here's the imagery. We've all seen how surgeons sometimes have to cauterize infected wounds. Uh, Isaiah's lips were cauterized. The hot and the holy touched the cold, the infected, the sinful and the unclean, making it clean all through a touch. All of a sudden, Isaiah's lips were clean, his sins were blotted out. But this wasn't all, because Isaiah's dream was not just a dream where he was made clean, Oh no, there was something else to come. And I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. All of the rigmarole of cleaning or cleansing Isaiah's lips was to prepare him for a lifetime service. He was made ready to share the Lord's word with others. This Bible reading from Isaiah is often chosen as one of the passages for Trinity Sunday, because as Christians, we believe in what's known as the Holy Trinity. And you all know this, I'm sure, because you've all been going to church for years. But we believe that God is three persons, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The seraphim cried out, holy, holy, holy. And indeed, we sang the same in our first hymn this evening. There are many ways that people try and explain this concept. This morning I preached at Wimpole Road Methodist Church and I explained how some people speak of three-leaved clovers, some people speak of the same man being a brother, a son and an uncle, but none of these really do the concept justice and some of them, in fact all of them, lead us into error. This error then serves only to confuse us even further. I find it much easier to keep my thinking simple. Instead of worrying about how God is three in one, and how all the mechanics work, let's just focus and give thanks that he is. Let's give thanks that God as Father created us, formed us out of the clay, breathed life into us and gave us free will. Let's give thanks that as Son, God redeemed and reclaimed us, saving us from sin and death and taking a punishment rightly ours upon himself. And let's give thanks that as spirit, God continues to be at work amongst us. As we reflected last week on uh, Pentecost Sunday, the Holy Spirit's descent at Pentecost was as much for you and me today as it was for those disciples. God, the creator, the redeemer and the sustainer. God in three persons, Father, Son and Spirit. Without one, relationship with God would be impossible. Without God being father, he would have no interest in us. After all, he would not have birthed us into creation. He would have no real connection with us as his children. You see it in animal documentaries, don't you? Uh, the, the, the elephant having no interest in the baby elephant because it was not one of their children. 
without God being the son, he would not have died for us. He would not have lived our life and shared in it with us. There would have been no Christian because there would have been no Christmas, because there would have been no Christ. The events of Easter would not have happened and we would be in as precarious a position as people were before Christ came. Without God being Holy Spirit, we would not be assured of his presence amongst us now. All of this would be stuff from the past, stuff of history, the stuff of legend, and there would be no need for us to believe in it. And if God was simply something from the past, it would mean that there would be no hope for us in the future. But our story does not end there. Because just as all of these events happened to Isaiah, and just as he was called out to do God's will, so God through Christ calls us to do the same. As we heard in our call to worship and in our second lesson, Jesus did not instruct his followers just to sit back and relax after he'd gone, but instead from Matthew 28, to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This calling is upon our lives, friends, as we continue to try and walk in the way of Jesus Christ. And just as was Isaiah, so too we are equipped and prepared for the task. Our lips may well be unclean, but God the Father has cleansed us through Christ. Yes, we may be unworthy, but Christ's death has sorted that too, and although we often don't know the way to go or how to do things, we can look to his life as an example, for through him our unworthiness is made worthy. Yes, we may be weak, but God's Holy Spirit strengthens us and provides for us, leading us in the way he sets. So as we go into the coming week, let us keep these passages of scripture in mind. Let's remember Isaiah's vision. Let's remember Jesus's instruction. And let's take heart that God will provide for all our needs if we just call out to him saying, here I am, send me. Thanks be to God. We come now to a time of prayer and I'd invite you to join with me. Let us pray. O God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. O God, the Son, saviour of the world. O God, the Holy Spirit, Lord and giver of life. We lift our hearts in gratitude to you for all your mercies and abundant kindnesses. We give you thanks, eternal God, that you made mankind in your own image and that when we fell away from you, you ransomed us by your Son. We thank you that by your Holy Spirit you have led us to believe your gospel, brought us into the fellowship of the church, and given us a share in the sure and certain hope of everlasting life. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever, world without end. Almighty God in heaven, who gave Jesus Christ as saviour of all, hear us as we pray for all your people, leading us in prayer by your Holy Spirit. Cleanse and renew the life of your church, O God, that Christ may ever rule in his house as Lord, and that the gospel may be sincerely believed and faithfully preached. Enrich all ministers with true understandings of your word, and make all Christian people as living witnesses of you. Bring into your fold all those who've strayed from your ways and those who have never known your grace, that your glory may be known in all the earth. Unite the nations of the world in peace and goodwill, we pray, granting that all peoples may be free to serve you and know your blessing. Guide those upon whom is led laid the responsibility of leadership, keeping them from all selfish and worldly ambition, and inspiring them to labour for the common good. Let your blessing rest upon this nation, we pray, 
that we may serve you in righteousness and peace all our days. Surround the Queen and her family with your grace and protection, and direct our government with wisdom. We pray for Boris, our Prime Minister in particular today, as he celebrated his marriage to Miss Simmons yesterday, praying that the covenant that he entered into with her may be a covenant of service, just as the covenant he's made with the electorate. May the Houses of Parliament and all devolved governments be filled with your grace, that personal ambition and gain may find no place, and that decency and honour may prevail. Expunge from our national life all that is offensive in your sight, and strengthen us in the love of righteousness, liberty and truth. Remember the towns and villages in which we dwell, we pray, that all those who lead public life may be guided by your spirit. Bless our neighbours, those we know well, and those we should know better. Draw near to all those whose hearts are burdened with care or sorrow, and give them grace to put their trust in you. Lay your hand of healing upon those who are sick, and so restore them to health and strength, that they may praise you for your goodness. Be with all those that mourn, those who tend the sick and dying, those who fear death, that all they may have their trust and hope in you. Dear God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, putting our trust in the fullness of your love and rejoicing that you have called us in your service, we pray that our lips also may be cleansed by the coal of your altar, and that we may be prepared for your service. Guide and bless us in the days ahead, that we may be faithful witnesses for your Son, and at the last may find our home with you, dwelling with all your saints, with your Son at your right hand. All these prayers we ask in the name of Jesus Christ who taught his disciples to pray in the words of the Lord's Prayer. As we draw near to the end of our service, friends, a few intimations for you. Firstly, that uh, this Wednesday, Wednesday the 2nd, is the next in our series of joint services between uh, the Parish Church of St Andrew, Wells Cone, Earls Cone Baptist Church and Chapel URC. Uh, this time we're meeting at Earls Cone Baptist Church for uh, a service based around Trinity Sunday, and I believe also including Holy Communion. Uh, I will be taking part representing Chapel URC and so will the 
uh, ministers from the parish church and the Baptist church. So it will be lovely if uh, any of you can make it. I don't know details about live streaming or the like, but if it's anywhere, it will be on the Old Stone Baptist Church website. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, secondly, our preacher next week, June the 6th, is my good friend, the Reverend Andy Braunston, who is Minister of Four URCs in and around Glasgow, and uh, is the father, if you like, of the URC's daily devotion emails. Uh, we look forward to welcoming him back. The following week, uh, I will be leading worship, and it will include our monthly uh, observance of Holy Communion. Uh, the elders of Chapel URC are hoping that if all goes to plan, we can return to in-person worship at Chapel on the 27th of June. Uh, God willing, of course, the restrictions will have been lifted in their entirety. Uh, but if not, I think the plan is that we continue uh, to return on the 27th, albeit with limited numbers. But more information on that nearer the time. Uh, but it is likely that our final cynical service, in a sense, hopefully forever, uh, will be on the 20th of June, when our preacher will be the Reverend Ken Forbes, Minister of Lion Walk with Chapel and Christ Church URCs. Here ends the notices. Our final hymn this evening, featuring uh, some of the imagery we heard in our Isaiah reading, God is in his temple, to the most wonderful tune ever written, I think. May God, the Holy Trinity, make you strong in faith and hope and love, and defend you on every side, guiding you in truth and peace. And may the blessing of God, who is Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon you and remain with you this night and forevermore. Amen. We sing, very appropriately, the doxology. <laughs>